This is Lee Rosenbaum, and I'm here with Keith Wilson. He's curator of ancient Chinese art at the Freer Sackler in the Smithsonian Institution. And we're here at an exhibition of Paul Singer's collection. Uh, it was all given in 1997 to the institution. And you're just getting around now to doing a show of some of the highlights. Uh, or some of the representative pieces in the collection. Um, so tell us sort of the, why it took so, a little bit about why it took so long and, and what kind of work has been going on in the collection. And let's go around and look at a few of the key pieces. Sure. Uh, well, Paul Singer died in 1997. Uh, it took some time to move the entire collection, some 5,000 objects, from his apartment in Summit, New Jersey, yes. uh, down here to Washington. Uh, when the gift was formally announced in 1999, uh, there was a small exhibition uh, in the Sackler entrance pavilion of a couple of dozen of the highlights of, of the Singer collection, mm -hmm. uh, with the promise that there was much more to come. Typically, when we acquire objects, we also have to conduct conservation studies uh, and other kinds of research, pr primarily provenance research, uh, to understand the object from as many different points of view as possible. That's mm -hmm. taken us some time. Sure. So this object here almost epitomizes the kind of collector he was. Right. Paul, Paul Singer uh, was a self-taught, self-trained collector. Yes. Um, in reading some of his writings, I think he also was an inveterate optimist, um, <laughs> always hoping that he was right and everybody else was wrong. Yeah, and so this uh, piece here... Uh, was when one of those inveterate optimist pieces, uh, and in this case, at least, he was vindicated. Right. When he bought this uh, in the 50s, everybody told him, of course, can't you see it's, a, it's an out and out forgery? Later in the 50s and in the 60s, additional examples were documented from scientifically excavated Chinese tombs. Mm -hmm. So yeah, he was vindicated, and in fact, this became the cover image on the 1965 Asia Society. Uh, exhibition of the Paul Singer collection written by Max Ler. And, and tell us what this is. Tell us what, what this object um, sure. is. Sure. <laughs> it's a, it's a, a burial sculpture, of course, missing its legs at this point, and yes. probably also missing what would have been a natural coarse hair uh, tail uh -huh. uh, that was made specifically for burial. As you can see, it's made in several different parts. Each of the legs were probably fashioned individually, like the head, mm. attached to the torso of the horse with. Uh, some kind of natural adhesive. Uh, what's interesting uh, from the art historical point of view is some of the painting is representational, i.e. it's showing you the trappings um, that were uh -huh. on, sure. uh, worn by the horse, but then there are also these kind of crazy decorative patterns that are only there to enrich the surface of, of the sculpture. Uh -huh. This is the kind of approach combining naturalism and decoration that is associated with the culture of Chu. Um, centered in South China, in the provinces of Hubei, Hunan province, mm -hmm. uh, where this horse was uh, probably excavated. Mm -hmm. I, I, I had never had a chance to do an exhibition on a collector, and, <laughs> and so I, I was um, I was delighted by the prospect, and I, I was trying to figure out how to do that. How do you communicate mm -hmm. the personality of a collector? Uh, well, luckily with Paul Singer. Um, who had a pretty big personality. <laughs> yes, it should I, be said I met him and, and was in his apartment once, and yes, he was quite a character. <laughs> um, I had a lot to go with. Um, he was, uh, as I said, an amateur. Uh, he didn't read Chinese, for example. Yes. Uh, but he was a very academically based collector and uh, an inveterate reader and researcher. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and so I basically chose some of those topics that I knew interested him the most. The, the culture of Chu, where the horse comes from and where these ceramics and lacquers come from, uh, is another case in point. This is an area of Chinese art history that um, really not until the 60s and 70s was well understood at all. Mm -hmm. uh, Singer was interested uh, in the subject as early as the 1940s. Here are a couple of low-fired ceramics that uh, on their surface carry traces of a tin foil. Yes. So gives uh, it a certain luster. Right. That's the exactly the shine that you're seeing there. It's now kind of reduced to, to powder. Yes. But imagine originally uh, completely encased in a in a thin uh, tin foil skin. 
uh, they would have been quite shiny. Probably uh, the choice was made to experiment with this combination of materials, very unusual, mm. uh, to simulate the shiny surface of a silver vessel, but at a much lower cost. I can't say for sure that uh, he bought the plaque on the right knowing that it was a forgery, mm. um, but the two plaques are clearly closely related. We've studied both of them and determined that the one on the left is authentic and the one on the right is not. Uh, the reason I suggest that he may have known that it was uh, not an original of the period, and here we're talking about 1800 BC to 1600 BC. These are the earliest the very things beginnings of the Chinese Bronze Age. Yeah. Um, what's interesting about the pair is the piece on the left uh, was widely published and uh, exhibited, mm -hmm. whereas the piece on the right he never, never was. Mm -hmm. And he did uh, collect forgeries, copies, and fakes um, knowingly, uh, believing that they helped uh, clarify his own eye in, in evaluating authentic objects. I've heard anecdotally from colleagues that he also used uh, copies, forgeries, and fakes to test uh, other collectors, students, and even uh, professors uh -huh. to gauge their uh, true understanding of the material culture of early China, not just the scholarship and the excavation histories, uh, but also just the materiality of objects. And here you have a, a very evocative look at his apartment, which, is in, which was in Summit, New Jersey, and which I had the pleasure of visiting when I interviewed him for the book I wrote on collecting, and, and you told me how these objects are arranged in very particular ways. You, you gain the understanding that the objects were arranged in the apartment, this is the living room of course, mm -hmm. uh, in such a way that it becomes almost a three-dimensional Chinese art history t timeline, or <laughs> matrix. Uh, you can see in the photo that objects are sorted by medium and then by type and date, mm -hmm. so that uh, it's almost a kind of taxonomy. This shelf has a lot of the um, weaponry, the chariot fittings, um, ferrules, um, uh, wooden, uh, the, the inlaid bronze um, finials that would have been used on uh, weapon shafts, uh, whereas uh, over here you see uh, the ritual vessels um, ranging in day from Shang through the Eastern Zhou. So the, the Singer collection uh, comes to an institution that also has two other major collections, the Freer and the Sackler. Um, tell us how these works from Singer, from these collections, uh, differ from and complement what the institution already had. Well, uh, the Freer and Sackler are both really dominated by their founding donors, yes. uh, both of whom are collectors. And uh, the institution is really built around the collections that they gave. Uh, the Freer collection is composed uh, primarily of great masterworks of Chinese art produced at seminal moments uh, in major metropolitan centers. Yes. So it's kind of um, the finest survey of uh, a range of materials across time in China mm -hmm. produced for the social elites. It's a collection of masterworks. Uh, the Sackler collection is a little bit different. It reflects the fact that Charles Freer died in 1919, was uh, guided by an, a, an aesthetic impulse. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Sackler was collecting almost a half century later, um, and times had changed, uh, academic outlooks had changed. He was, I think, inspired by a more anthropological approach to looking at material culture. Um, seeing evidence in objects of cultural interaction, uh, of differences between metropolitan centers and periphery. What's great about the Singer collection, and this gathering of objects here kind of um, symptomizes it, uh, it's more archaeological in character. Yes. Uh, it's the, it composed of a, a lot of objects that um, are perfectly authentic and reflect the kinds of things that are found in standard Chinese burials, mm -hmm. not necessarily masterworks. Mm. Um, but as a result, it constitutes a, a character of object that the museum was not particularly rich in before. So it broadly amplifies the kinds of stories that we can tell 
and the views of early China that we can share with, uh, with our visitors. Okay, thanks very much. Sure.